So then we submitted a motion to uh, submit an additional 2,000 words. So we would have the same number of words, which the judges allowed. That gave us an opportunity to retort some of the things that Susan G. Howe was saying. In Susan G. Howe's um, response here, she's claiming that it was Carenza and three of his associates. There were a lot more than three people there. What she's trying to do is minimize the danger that I felt by claiming there were fewer people there. So on video, how can you miss this? She's either blind or incompetent. It's all subjective. She's either blind or incompetent, or she's intentionally lying. Or she's intentionally lying. But what she's trying to do is minimize the fear that I felt and minimize the actions of Carenza. Because again, riot is if you're doing that with five or more people. By claiming there were three people, she's then by minimizing what Carenza was doing. She even admitted in there that Carenza posed a threat to me. Carenza and three other people posed a threat to me. She's saying other than Carenza and his three associates, no one else posed a threat to him. So she's saying right there, Carenza posed a direct threat to me. Even Ryan Rasmussen, the ambush witness, he even concluded on the witness stand that Carenza and the dude shedding his backpack were direct threats to me and that I was justified on drawing on them. Even the guy, even the guy brought in to debunk everything about my case agreed to that. Um, so now we wait. We're waiting on the appeals court. There's no uh, legal limit on their time. They can go as long as they want before they make a decision. They don't ever have to rule. Libertarian Party waited five years before they got their ruling because there's two Libertarian parties in the state and they were both fighting each other in court for who, who, would, who would officially own the Libertarian Party. <laughs> Um, there, there was another case um, filed in December of 2016, over two years ago, where a guy, they just recently overturned it, where a guy was found guilty in a trial where he wasn't even at. He, the defendant wasn't there and his attorney wasn't there, and the judge allowed the trial to happen. It took the appeals court over two years oh <laughs> to rule that, that, to reverse that, to rule, yeah, this guy had a right to his trial. You denied him his right. So, you know, I've abided by everything they've told me to do because the last thing I want is trouble with them. Um, and, and now we just wait. You know, meanwhile, my life is in limbo. My whole life is turned upside down. You know, I'd pay all these fees. I'm now branded with all this stuff while I continue to fight this. Um, you know, I lost my apartment, had to give up a bunch of my belongings. And it's not fair. 80 DAs, hundreds of people in the state DOG, thousands of police, thousands of activists, powerful media. It's not fair for them. They're going to need a hell of a lot more than that. They want to take me down. And I am prepared to take this as far as I need to take it, to whatever court I need to take it, for however long I need to do this, until it's overturned at whatever point it needs to be overturned at. The civil rights of everybody is at stake. My life is at stake. The rights of journalists are at stake. The rights of the community are at stake. What's interesting here is the officer that had me in custody for most of the night of um, the altercation here. I actually seen him at a previous event a couple years prior. It was a town hall for Ginny Burdick, the state senator, another person that I love to film and post videos about. Now, she refuses to take open questions at her town halls. Um, you have to do little written questions, and they pick and choose which ones they're going to answer. So the only way to actually ask her something is after the event. And so I start asking her questions at the event as she's starting to leave. Now, she's got five police officers surrounding her. She's calling for all these gun restrictions, saying introducing a gun to a situation makes it more volatile. Yet she hires, on our dime, five plainclothes Portland police officers to, uh, to be at this town hall with her. So I'm asking her these questions, and she doesn't want to answer them, of course, because they're, they're tough questions about the actual policies and bills that she's supporting and introducing. So I'm asking her the questions, and eventually this, this police officer turns to me and goes, okay, okay, you've had enough. If you keep doing this, it's gonna be harassment. Hmm. That's the same officer who had me in custody 
on the evening of this, who I was trying to explain to what had happened and who I was trying to get to watch the videos. So according, I'm leaving his name out for very strategic reasons. According to the Portland police, asking a publicly elected official questions at a public event, at a public venue where the public is invited, that's harassment. But if instead I were to see Ginny Burdick in a public area, and I gathered up a gang of masked thugs, and we had sticks in our hand, and we decided to encircle her from behind, and we started pushing and shoving her, shouting obscenities at her, demanding that she leave a public area, according to the Portland police, perfectly acceptable behavior. Again, when I say that the public is at risk, that's what I mean. Everybody's at risk. You know, and I'll compare this. Let's say there's a black dude who works for the Parks Department. And let's say he gets assigned a park in a racist neighborhood. You know, there's a lot of talk of white supremacists in the Pacific Northwest. Um, let's say he gets assigned to work at a park there. Let's say the people in that neighborhood don't like him because he's black or for whatever reason. So they see him there doing his job, like I was doing my job, and they don't like him. Let's say they file a police report saying, oh, yeah, we saw him out by the school in his van. It looked like he was picking out children to go and molest. Now they can make this police report. They never contact the black dude about it. They can make the police report that says he's a suspected child molester, just like John Slaughter did to me, saying that I'm a suspected white supremacist and is accusing me of all this uh, other racist stuff towards him. These other people can do the same thing. So let's say a mob of literally KKK guys decide they, they don't like the black dude working in the park. So they're going to put their hoods on, just like these guys put their masks on. They're going to go and visit. They're, they're going to plan their, their thing. Their security cameras at the park that capture it all. And they're going to go and do to the black parks worker exactly what the mob did to me. And the black parks worker tries to get away. He's trying to get away from them. They, they've surrounded him. They're starting to push and shove him. And he's trying to get away. And they're continuing to come after him. Let's say as part of his job that day, he was you know, slinging down um, bushes and whatnot. He has a machete with him. So he pulls his machete out on the KKK guys to get them to back off. Now it's the black dude. If you apply the same standard to me, now it's the black dude who faces the charges. And the KKK guys who started the fight, they're considered to be innocent victims. Okay. So they can pull, they can do that same thing to that. Um, the NRA has been completely useless. They've been of, of no help to this. Um, anybody who's ever asked the NRA for, for help about me, they all know we're not going to help strictly. It's criminal. So if you're an NRA member, or if you have NRA's carry guard, and this happens to you, NRA is not going to be there to help you. Not financially, not PR-wise. They're going to talk smack about you behind your back. Oregon Firearms Federation, they've been the ones helping throughout all of this. Because they're the ones actually on the ground doing things here in Oregon. So at this point, I will try to take questions if we can. I think we have two or five. OK, all right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Laughing at Liberals is the name of my YouTube channel. I put up a lot of videos about the case. Um, you can go back and watch all this stuff. Lots of raw videos. I put up lots of audio parts of the shenanigans that have gone on, the lies that have been told, proven to be lies, um, things that the district attorneys have said. Um, Benjamin Karenza's lengthy criminal history. Is your YouTube channel still up? Yeah. Okay. It's just not very active because I'm banned from filming political events. Right. Question. Yes. Two questions. One. Can you go for federal super civil rights thing? We do intend on that. Um, the first step towards that, from what I gather, is um, is getting it overturned at the end. And the next question is, how do you get 10? In fact, this is an invite. Right. Yeah. Out of four. Out of four. Yeah. Yeah. Four, 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 four. I mean, I'm asking. Oh, yeah. You have, three, 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 three. You, you have four people, but you got ten. They're claiming there's ten people in the immediate uh, uh, No, but no, but, but, but the appeal process, they said there's only four. Oh, right, right, right. right. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but or as a sentencing. <laughs> that, that, that's, I didn't catch that. As far as, like, that's good. allow me to have contact.